drawing on my roots in a southern black church and my involvement in the civil rights movement, I greet each of you as my sisters and my brothers all. Good morning. And I'm going to draw once again on my southern roots and say it's a great getting up morning. <laughs> I want to thank Sister Chair Kaywin and Brother President Ford Bell and the organizers of this year's AAM conference for giving me the extraordinary honor of offering this keynote address. We have gathered in a city that is often described as the cradle of the civil rights movement, a movement that called for, struggled for, and indeed brought about monumental changes in our nation, a movement that inspired other movements for freedom and justice in America and around the world. We are in this city called Atlanta, a city that is the birthplace of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., the man that Nina Simone called the Dark Prince of Peace. We are in a city called Atlanta that is the home of major institutions that address issues of social justice. The Martin Luther King National Historic Site, the Carter Center, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. And because we are in such a city as this, the theme for this 2015 AAM annual meeting is especially appropriate. The social value of museums inspiring change. Over the course of the next few days that we are together, there will be many responses to this theme. What I have chosen to do in this keynote address is to make the case that our museums can and must be of social value by not only inspiring, but creating change around one of the most critical issues of our time, the issue of diversity. For us in the world of museums, that means inspiring and creating far greater diversity in our workforces, our exhibitions, our educational programs, and yes, among our visitors. Now, I would love to be able to directly make contact with all of the colleagues here from other parts of the world. I know you are there. And so please hear me when I say that in speaking about the need for greater diversity in American museums, I know that your realities may be quite different. I can only hope that there will be at least a few points that I will make that will resonate with you. I also want to acknowledge the other slant in this talk, and that is that I am drawing most heavily on the museums that I know best, art museums. And to my colleagues who work in zoological parks and aquariums, please know that I know that you too are wrestling with the question of diversity in your places. Now, colleagues all, I believe that we cannot fully carry out the mission and indeed the visions 
of our museums, if we do not find the way, a good Southern expression, make a way out of no way to bring greater diversity in who works in our museums, in the work we present in our museums, in the audiences we welcome to our museums, and in the philanthropic and board leadership in our museums. One of my sheroes, and you know, for every hero in the world, there's at least one shero. <laughs> one of my sheroes, the late Dr. Maya Angelou, issued a call to all women and men who are parents when she said this, it is time for parents to teach young people early on that in diversity there is beauty and there is strength. In our museums, we have the possibility to teach that same important message. When we look back at the history of American museums, we see that they were products of and reflections of the political, economic, and social times. Back in the day, museums were run by and largely catered to middle-aged and middle-income and upper-class white folks. And the collections, exhibitions, educational programs reflected what one of my colleagues Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftall at Spelman College, what she calls the three W's. They were largely focused on Western places and ideas. The overwhelming majority of the staff and the visitors were white folks. And the exhibitions were largely womanless. Now let me briefly reference my own experience with museums back in the day. Like all African Americans who grew up in the pre-civil rights days of legal segregation in the South, as a youngster, I went to colored schools, used the colored public library, and only drank from the colored water fountains, forced always to sit in the back of the bus. There were no art galleries or museums in Jacksonville, Florida that I could visit or that any African American could visit. But how fortunate I was to have a mom who had a passion for the visual arts now, as we would say in the art world, she had the eye. And she had the, the will and the means to adorn our home with reproductions of artworks that, ironically, I would not have seen in museums had I been permitted to visit them. And so in the home that I grew up in, were reproductions of masterworks of African-American artists. And there were books on the art of Henry Tanner and Romare Bearden and Elizabeth Catlett and Lois Melu Jones, Charles White, Augusta Savage, Aaron Douglas. Today, with legalized segregation a thing of the past, I can go to any museum whose interest fee, if there is one, I can afford. And yet too often, I will not find much in those museums which reflects the history, the her story, the culture, and the art of who I am and underrepresented people of our country and of the world. Today, from a legal standpoint, every American museum must honor EEO guidelines. 
But we also say it's just the right thing to do, to have diversity in our museum staff, boards, programs, and audiences. It is also the smart thing to do if we want our museums to be vibrant 21st century places that reflect the diversity of our nation and the world. A comprehensive look at diversity in our museums would include an assessment of the presence and the absence of the range of underrepresented groups. That is, people whose primary identity is based on their race. As an anthropologist, I'm not sure what that is, so I'll say race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, age, their religion, nationality, class, physical abilities, and disabilities. Now, I've used the term primary identity because each of us has multiple identities. Another of my sheroes, Audre Lorde, had a wonderful way of making this point about our multiple identities. I had the privilege and the joy of knowing and learning from Audre Lorde when we both taught at Hunter College. Before she would begin a talk and offer a reading from her work, she would introduce herself by saying, I am Audre Lord, a black woman, feminist, lesbian, professor, poet, mother, warrior. <laughs> and then Audre Lord would say, please do not relate to me as if I have but one identity, for I do not wake up in the morning and from 7 a.m. to 8, I am black. But when 8 a.m. comes, I become a woman. Ah, and only for an hour, because at 9 a.m., I will be a feminist. Hmm, better get ready, because on the stroke of 10, I will turn into a lesbian. <laughs> Let me return to the point that embracing, encouraging, and, in, and sustaining a diverse workforce in our museums is the right thing to do. That is, there should be an equal opportunity for all qualified people to not only enter the workforce at our museums, but to be welcomed there and to be supported to advance in our museums. But there is that second reason for having and sustaining a diverse workforce. We call it the smart thing to do. There, that won't work. <laughs> there is, within the corporate world, among businesses, what is called the business case for diversity. And that is to say, the feeling with documentation that a company will do better the more diverse the folk who are there, who serve on the board, the folk who sit around the table and are able to bring different ideas to that table. I also happen to feel that you know, it's intellectually exciting to be among diverse people. This business case for diversity in American companies rests heavily on demographic realities. Over the past few decades, there have been massive demographic changes and social shifts. You know as well as I, that the U.S. Census data says that currently 35 percent, 
of all U.S. residents are minorities. Demographers have let us know that this trend, it will not only continue, it will accelerate well into the next several decades. In the next 30 years, the United States will become a majority minority country with white folks no longer in the majority. The future of American philanthropy, like the future of everything else in the United States, will be shaped by increasing racial and ethnic diversity. According to the Minnesota Council on Foundation, who donates and what they give will be profoundly impacted by this shift in the population. And public policy will become more representative of minority communities. Anna Lehman, the retiring director of the Brooklyn Museum, puts it this way. Arnold says, for our museums, diversity is a critical issue and the most important book any museum director should read is the U.S. Census. <laughs> so let's take a look at the state of workforce diversity in our American museums. Today, the professional staff at most American museums, these staff do not mirror the diversity of the American people or the world. If I look at our art museums, currently only 20% of art museum staff in all positions are people of color. And when we look how often we find that the majority of the people of color are doing that essential and never appreciated enough work of guarding our priceless works and cleaning the very places in which they hang. When we look at the number of people in senior positions, it really is not a good picture. I believe you can't lead where you won't go. You can't talk about other folk if you don't talk about yourself. So let me say that among the 243 museums of the Association of Art Museum Directors, fewer than 5% have people of color in senior management positions. Another of our colleagues, Tony Herschel, director of the Smart Museum of Art at the University of Chicago, led an AAMD task force on diversifying membership. And he said this, few museums would say that their staffs are as diverse as they should be, which begs the question that Tony also has asked, how can we create a new stream of professionals that is more diverse. Now, of course, once a museum is successful, and many are, in recruiting a diverse staff, the question is, what kind of an environment, what kind of an atmosphere and culture will these diverse colleagues encounter? I cannot stress enough the importance of an inclusive culture that says in countless ways, all colleagues from all backgrounds are welcome at this museum table. Now, in addition to asking questions about racial and ethnic diversity among museum staff, we must also ask who visits our museums. While people of color make up over a third of the American population, according to a National Endowment 
for Arch Report, people of color make up only 9% of museum visitors. Brother President Ford Bell has made this point. He says the big challenge is going to be how museums deal with the increasingly diverse American public which could be 30% or more Hispanic by 2050. If you go to a museum, Ford says, and you don't see anyone who looks like you, from visitors to staff, and the boards are not reflecting the community, you may be less likely to come back or even to go in the first place. Marketing studies say the obvious. They affirm the obvious fact that African Americans are more likely to attend events that are characterized as black themed and events where black people are well represented among the performers. Studies of Latino attitudes towards museums show similar results. A report by the Smithsonian American History Museum found second-generation Latinos surveyed had very strong expectations that museums should include diverse staff, bilingual interpretation, Latino perspectives, and some Latino-themed content. In Houston, our colleague, the late Peter Marzio of the Museum of Fine Arts, started a Latin American department in response to the city's rapidly expanding Latino community. Peter also added several permanent Asian art galleries in response to Houston's growing and diverse Asian community. And he did not start these exhibitions and programs in some vacuum, but rather by engaging the local community and seeing what they wanted. It resulted in very strong local support, donations, and engagement. As an example, the Korean community donated over $2 million for a permanent art collection. Now let me turn to the situation about those of us who are described in a Native American saying as holding up half of the sky, us women folks. Where do we stand in terms of women on museum staffs? Among the museums in the Association of Art Museum Directors, we women make up only slightly less than 50% of all of the directors. However, of the 243 members of the Association of Art Museum Directors, there are only five African American women. And of course, it is important to note that the larger a museum's budget, the less likely it is that the director is a woman. I thought I'd share with you just a few facts assembled by the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C. 51% of all visual artists today are women, and yet, over the past 15 years, only 28% of museum solar exhibitions spotlighted women in eight selected museums. Only 27 women are represented in the current edition of H.W. Janssen's survey, History of Art. Hmm. Only 27 women. Well, at least that's up from zero in the 1980s. And I can't resist sharing this fact. 
less than 3% of the artists in the modern section of the Metropolitan Museum of Art are women. But 83% of the nudes are women. <laughs> now, women continue to lag behind men in directorships held where the budgets, let me do that again, women lag behind men in directorships held at museums with budgets over $15 million. We women folks hold these directorships in museum after museum after museum, but we only get 71 cents for every dollar earned by our male counterparts. Calvert Investments discovered that companies whose commitment to diversity was viewed as robust were not only at a financial advantage, but were also better positioned to generate long-term shareholder value. In addition, advocacy groups like Catalyst, a nonprofit organization that promotes inclusive workplaces for women, Catalyst found that Fortune 500 companies with higher percentages of women board members significantly outperformed companies with fewer female members. That's the business case for women and diversity. And let us note that women have more philanthropic clout than ever before consistently outgiving their male counterparts. I also want to say a few words about American museums and LGBTQ communities. Whatever the number of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals there are among museum professionals, and such statistics are not available. But whatever are the numbers, it is clear that American museums have paid grossly insufficient attention to artworks done by and about individuals of these communities. The exhibition at the Smithsonian's Portrait Gallery, Hide, Seek, Difference and Desire in American Portraiture was the first museum exhibition to focus on themes of gender and sexuality in modern American portraiture. Now I'm sure you will recall that there was a major controversy around that exhibition when the Smithsonian removed a 1987 video about the suffering caused by AIDS. And at the Smithsonian, we continue to talk about what we have learned from that controversy. The major point I am still making, however, is that we need to make sure that everyone from LGBTQ communities, that everyone is welcomed, and included in our museums. We must also address the question of how inclusive our museums are in terms of exhibitions, huh. ah, exhibitions by and about differently abled people. We must ask ourselves to what extent our museums welcome disabled professional staff and the extent to which our museums accommodate and welcome people who have disabilities. And then I must ask, how are we doing in terms of igniting the interests of, as I call them respectfully and affectionately, the young'uns? <laughs> now, as you know, 
Millennials are quite different from yesterday's museum goers. Different in how they see the world, how they engage with technology, how they pursue and sometimes demand attention to their interests. It's not being overly dramatic to say that unless we make changes in our museums that will speak to the patterns and interests of younger people, when the middle-aged, the older folk who are now our core visitors go on off to glory, <laughs> our museum galleries will be places in which there is a dwindling number of visitors. Now, we all know that our museums must become more technologically savvy if we're going to court the millennials whose electronic devices have become extensions of their bodies. Not only is reaching out to the millennial generation important for cultivating healthy visitorship, it is critical for preparing the next generation of donors and trustees. While the baby boomer generation has been the main source of charitable giving and philanthropic leadership for decades, the realities and habits of the millennial generation are not the same as the current generation, and I mean the aging generation. From a recent Trends Watch report compiled by our own American Alliance of Museums and buttressed by information from a recent New York Times article wooing a new generation of museum patrons, we learned this. While charitable giving in the United States has remained stable for the last 40 years, there's reason for concern. Boomers today control 70% of the nation's disposable income. Millennials don't yet have nearly as much cash on hand, and those who do are increasingly drawn to social rather than artistic causes. The fiscal reality of the millennial generation is not the same as the reality of older, my generation. Tax laws are changing, and wealth is becoming increasingly concentrated which will in turn affect the philanthropic habits and the focus on giving of the younger generation. Also, there may just be less or fewer wealthy patrons and donors, making donor relations and cultivation even more of the center of our work. So my sisters and brothers all, colleagues, when we pause to confront the need for far greater diversity in our museums, in many ways we are at the proverbial fork in the road. And we cannot do as Yogi Berra said you should do with the fork of the road, namely take it. <laughs> no. We have to decide if we will take the fork that represents continuing to have our museums, our zoos, our aquariums reflect the histories, the cultures, the art, and yes, focus on the science of only some of the many people who make up our great nation and our world? Or do we take the other fork that requires inspiring and creating change? If your museum is large or small, old or young, famous or not yet famous, the need for seeking and sustaining diversity in your museum and in mine has never been greater. If we are to be relevant in this ever-changing world, 
If we are to stay artistically and financially viable, then all of our museums must boldly, indeed bodaciously, commit to rethinking about what takes place in our museums, to whom our museums belong, and who the colleagues are who have the privilege of telling important stories through the power of science, history, culture, and art. As members of AAM, you, my colleagues, are aware of efforts in our organization, this organization, to address issues of diversity in our museums. There are also programs initiated by other museum organizations like AAMD and by foundations like Ford and Mellon, efforts to encourage far greater involvement of underrepresented groups in every facet of American museums. There is no city that is, more, that is a more appropriate place for us to commit to the task of bringing greater diversity to who works in American museums and to the work that our museums do. And there is no time that is more appropriate for us to carry out this commitment than right now. So let us heed the counsel of Atlanta's son, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Let us heed his counsel in terms of how we are to get this critical work done. Dr. King said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. My sisters and brothers, all I want to bring closure on this talk by telling you a story. It is a story that was a favorite of a great civil rights worker, Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer loved to tell this story at the end of a talk as a way of saying, now who's going to do all this work that she had just talked about? The last line in the story that I'm going to tell you will say who's in charge, who is going to do this critical work of bringing far greater diversity into our museums. It's a story about some boys who one day decided to play hooky from school. Well, it was no fun just to play hooky if they couldn't get into trouble. So they looked around to see what mischief they could do. And they found a bird. And under the leadership of one of the boys, they then began to mess with that poor bird. I mean, just unkindly dealing with that bird until they bo were bored with that. So now what could they do? The ringleader said, I've got, a, I've got an idea. Let's go up the road a piece to where that old lady lives. She thinks she knows everything. Well, she doesn't. And I'm going to ask that old lady a question she'll never be able to answer. Well, what's the question, said his buddies. Aha, said he. I'm going to take this bird that we've been messing with and I'm going to put it behind my back and I'm going to say, oh lady, oh lady, this bird that I hold behind my back, is it dead or is it alive? Now, 
if the old lady says the bird, why, it's dead. I'm going to release my hand and the bird will fly away. But if to my question the old lady says, why, the bird is alive, I'm going to crush it. So they did their high fives and their bumps and feeling absolutely empowered with what they assumed to be their brilliance, off they went to find the old lady. And in a tone that does characterize some of our young folk, clearly not all, the ringleader said, yo, old lady, you gonna answer this question? And with that, that depth of humanity that so characterizes so many of our elders, the old lady said, well, my son, I will try. He said, well, all right, you see this bird? I'm going to hold it behind my back. Now you tell me, old lady, is this bird dead or is it alive? The old lady, like the old folks in that southern community that I grew up in, decided to take her own sweet time. And so she said, hmm, the bird, uh-huh, uh-huh. You want me to tell you about the bird? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Remember, what the old lady says is the answer to the question. Who is responsible for doing the work of bringing far greater diversity into our museums? Finally, the old lady was ready with her answer. And she said, hmm, the bird. Why, it's in your hands. That's the answers. Sister and brothers all, greater diversity, making it happen in our museums, it's in your hands and in mine. Thank you very much. <laughs>